I talked my wife into speaking with me this morning. Uh, I was telling some of our guests, I'm no dummy. I know I look better when she's on the stage. So uh, I I asked her to be up here with me this morning, and we want to speak to you guys this morning. So I want you to grab your Bibles, and if you would, turn to Philippians, the fourth chapter. Philippians, the fourth chapter. And we have a portion of Scripture that we want to talk about this morning, and we're going to do it together, hopefully not at the same time but we're going to look at this scripture this morning. Once you found it, one of the traditions that we've been doing in our church for several years is we stand and make a confession to the Lord together. So once you found that in your Bibles, I want to ask you to stand and let's make this confession together this morning, would you? We'll have it up on the screen. You guys can follow along if this is your first time. And we like to say it like we mean it, all right? So say it out loud. Here we go. Today I will open the word of God. May it be a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. May I hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Now, Lord, I will open my heart to receive from you. I will open my ears to hear from you. I will open my eyes to see the needs of others. And I will open my mouth to tell of your goodness. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Okay, you guys, give me just a second. I have this little device that I'm wearing and it's not coming on. Dad, can you help me with it? I'm pushing it. Got it. I'm I'm wearing this little uh, this little device. My my mom is here, and and uh, she has a cochlear implant, and it helps her to be able to hear my message. Uh, so instead of her wearing earphones or me having to be real close up here, she can sit where she needs to, and then she can hear me directly. And let me tell you, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So I'm going to do whatever I need to do. All right. That's just the way that goes. So if you see that on me, you'll understand where that comes from. Um, Hey, I wanted to speak with you guys this morning, just about, uh, storms. We're going to continue this little theme that we've been doing and talking about the storms of life. Last week, we talked about where is God in the storms and what happens when we have storms that come through our life. And this morning, we're going to continue on and and just talk about storms and equipping you for the storms. How many of you know that their storms are coming? All right? They're inevitable. There's no way we can get past them. Things are going to happen in our lives. Things are going to happen in your life. That's just the way life goes. There's going to be cold coming. We're getting ready for the winter months. We're getting ready. We don't know what that has in store for us. There are going to be storms that happen in our life, but we have to prepare and be ready for those things when they come. So whether you're in a storm right now or whether you're in a calm right now, you know that there are going to be things that happen in your life that you're going to have to get ready for. And so this morning, we want to help you, equip you so that you can get ready for the storms. A couple of weeks ago, I told you that I had some flowers that I had bought. I bought some flowers, and they were sitting out on the front porch at our house. And I've been watering these things and keeping them alive. Uh, whenever I can think about it, I'll water them, or if the rain comes down. But no matter how much I water those things, they were in pots, sitting on our front porch or on the, the, the cement there on our walkway. And it was just tough keeping those things alive. And I said a couple of weeks ago, it's important that I plant these flowers in the ground so that they can grow. Because they can't stay. I can, I can keep them going just by watering them day after day. But if I can get them in the ground, then the water from the earth and the, the moisture from the ground can keep them going. That's where they were meant to be. They weren't meant to be in pots on my front porch. They were meant to be in the ground. Well, I got good news. I planted them. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. We have, yeah, there they are. I planted them. So I, I, I got them finally in the ground, and I got them planted. Now, as I'm planting these flowers, my wife wasn't like bribing me or telling me I had to. I did it on my own accord. I'm sipping over here so I can get a pat on the back. It's not coming. I have to coax those things sometime. But I got them done, and I just kept thinking, listen, I want to get these done because it's going to get cold outside. And usually what happens for me for in, in, in our home 
Uh, this time of year, all I can think about is being outdoors in, in the woods, hunting, doing something. I mean, that's all I can think about. And so every chance I get, that's kind of what I'm thinking about doing. And what happens is that all the things at home get moved to the side. And then by the time I finally get back and get enough free time to do some at home, it's cold outside. The ground is hard. Everything has died. There's nothing worse than flowers that have gone through a freeze. And now they're just mushy. And you got to pull those up out of the ground. So I knew that we've got cold weather coming. I wanted to get this done now so that I can relax later instead of relaxing now and having to do it when the situation wasn't right. As I was doing that and preparing for all this and putting this stuff together, I thought, you know what? That's exactly what we do as believers. We have to understand that we have to prepare today for what's coming tomorrow. Because there's going to be cold weather coming. There's going to be times coming in the future when I, am, I need some time off. I'm going to need that rest. I'm going to need the time that I can do that. I need that. And so I need to work today while I can to make sure that when tomorrow comes, I've got that preparation done. You know what? Us as believers, that's what we have to do. In our spiritual lives and in our times, we have to understand there are going to be times of turmoil in the future. We're going to have situations that come up. We're going to have a job that looks like it's coming to an end. We're going to have a family member that's going through distress. We're going to have a, a, a marriage that's going to have some rocky things or some kids that, that begin to, to drift off in different directions. And we need some sort of foundation to help us know how to get through those times of life. There's going to be other terrorist attacks. There's going to be more hurricanes. There's going to be more situations that happen in life. But I have to have some kind of anchor in my life that's founded in something more than wishful thinking. And that anchor has to be in what I believe is the Word of God. Because this is the instruction book that we've had for centuries that has never changed, that is consistent, is faithful, and speaks to every aspect of the human heart. And so this morning, we want to talk to you just out of the Word of God so that you can see what it means for us to go through these times and how we can get through them. So I want you to look at this scripture. Philippians, here the fourth chapter, and going to begin reading right at the fourth verse, about halfway through. Let me tell you a little bit about Philippians. Philippians was written by Paul. Paul was in Rome in prison at the time. He wrote to Philippians. There were some situations going on in Philippians, in the Philippian church, and and at Philippi, and he speaks directly to that. This letter was directly to that church. And in this letter, it was a letter of encouragement. He spends most of his time lifting them up and praising them and encouraging them and speaking about joy and peace. That's what he's doing in this letter. So he's encouraging these saints to the persecutions that they're going through. So let me read this portion of scripture to you, starting at the fourth verse. And this is the very last part of it, of, of this letter. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. A couple of key words I want you to look at there. The first key word I want you to look at is in the sixth verse where it says, but in everything, by prayer. He said, listen, there's going to be tumultuous times that happen in your life. As a matter of fact, some of you may be anxious about what you're going through in life right now. The key to getting out of this situation is prayer. So the first thing we have to do is we have to understand we have to have right praying in our life. We have to have a right process of prayer within our life. Now, let me back up just a little bit. When you start looking at this scripture, Philippians was written by Paul. Paul was in, in prison in Rome. Philippians was written in around uh, 62 or 63 AD. Now, why is that important? Well, if you go back and look at Roman times and Roman emperors, Nero was the Roman emperor at that time. Nero came into power about 54, and then he was finally disposed of in, in about 68. So in this process of time, Nero was the emperor. What does that mean? Do you know who Nero was? Have you heard any stories of who Nero was? He was, the most ruth, he was the most ruthless emperor that, that, that Rome ever had. He was, especially to Christians, 
He started out as kind of a, a, an okay type emperor, but as time went by, his ego became so inflated and his sense of power and his need for hunger, uh, his hunger for power became just out of control to the point that in 64, Rome actually almost burned down. Almost three quarters of Rome burnt down. It was, it was, um, it was, they blamed it on an oil factory there, or a, an oil business that was producing oil for lamps that began to, to burn. But many people think that Nero actually orchestrated the fire so that he could burn Rome down, so that he could rebuild it to his specifications and his desires. They don't really know, but Rome burnt and Nero came and it was even said that while the, the, the town was burning or the city was burning, he was in one of his palaces up on a perch and he was watching all of it and laughing and mocking it as it was happening. And Nero, to try to get the, the focus off of him, he said it was the Christians who did it and began to persecute Christians. And there was great persecution of the Christian faith to the extent that he would have fun with it. He would make sport of it. He would take Christians and he would put them in fur and he would kill them like animals in his palace as sport for his guests that would come to his parties. He was also told that he would take Christians and he would wrap them in, in rags of oil and he would set them on fire and use them in his courtyard to light his parties. And these human corpses would be burning up on poles to give light to his parties as they had fun and as they ate and drank. He, he was a cruel man. Now understand within that context, understand that's what these Christians were going through. So when Paul is giving them encouragement, if you just go through Philippians here and begin to read some of these passages, as you go through, you see Paul, he's always encouraging them. He's always telling them, listen, what's getting ready to happen? I know that you're going through persecution. Some of the greatest scriptures that we have um, in, in, like in chapter three, verse number 12, he says, not that I have already attained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to hold on to that which Christ has taken hold of me. Paul is just saying to them, hold on, be patient. I know you're going through persecution. I know it's rough out there. I know that every day when you go to sleep, there may be turmoil in your life. You may be going through persecution and problems and situations, but I want you to know there is a faith that surpasses anything that you've ever known. There is a suffering that you are going going to go through. But as you go through that suffering, it's going to bring you into the very presence of God. He's trying to encourage them and tell them, listen, storms are a coming. There's going to be situations in your life that are, that are going to be dire, but we want you to know something. God is going to be there with you. He's going to take care of you. So the first thing you have to do, you have to learn to pray. Boom. I'm turning it over to you. All right. High five. I got this. You know, I, I probably don't say enough good things about you because he did spend all of that time planting those flowers and making the yard look so good. Well, I'm and liking this. Put down fresh mulch. And do you guys know Take all the that time you need. yesterday morning I woke up, I put my slippers on and I sat on the couch and I watched a Hallmark movie while my husband made me homemade French toast. He's pretty much the perfect man. Pretty much. <laughs> Okay, so why don't you have one of these shirts on? <laughs> I forgot. I'm sorry. I should be wearing an I Love My Pastor shirt because I certainly do. And now I find myself a little bit speechless because I'm, I'm going to Hawaii. We're going to Hawaii. I, I really can't believe it. I, I find it hard to believe. I mean, I was just thinking when, when Kelly was ta saying we were going to speak in Philippians chapter four, and it, it starts out by telling us to rejoice in the Lord always. And just, again, I say rejoice and I'm thinking, but how can I always just rejoice when my world just feels like it's falling apart, when things just aren't going my way or it's not going that well for me? And you're saying, yeah, Lisa, things look like they're going pretty good for you. I mean, your, your husband makes you French toast and you're going to Hawaii. I don't know. It doesn't get very much better than that, but it's not always that way. You should see my garage. <laughs> I think that's on his checklist, though. Oh, that hurt. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, and we're back. <laughs> and we're back. But the truth is, is that um, it's not always about rejoicing. What amazes me about the scripture is that Paul really did write this from prison. When he's telling us 
reminding us how to pray correctly and saying, and starting that by saying, rejoice, you need to find that joy. You can't just find your joy in your present circumstance when your circumstance is difficult and just expect it to be there. It, it has to be in you already because there's no way that he could be sitting in prison and be joyful and rejoicing if it wasn't already in him. If he wasn't already, he's telling us to be um, gracious. And I'm thinking gracious, he's in prison. My life stinks, I can't pay my bills, my job is on the line, my husband is mean, I think I'm, I might be headed for a divorce, my family is falling apart. You want me to rejoice in this? But here's the good news for you. You are not in prison. You're not in prison, you're sitting here today. You're free to walk in this church, you're free to walk out of this church. You're free to leave here and go eat whatever you want. You're free to put your feet up on your couch this afternoon and take a nap. You can eat whatever you want for dinner. You're not in prison. So when he's saying, find your graciousness, some, some translations say, find your gentleness. And you know why? Before he tells us to pray, because he says the Lord is near. You see, Paul, in prison understood firsthand how God would be near to us. The, in, in Matthew 28, at the very end, um, Jesus, his, his last words were, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. And you see, him being with us isn't something to just take lightly because those words that he was saying when he was speaking to his disciples came after his death after his resurrection, that God, Jesus is before them saying, I will be with you no matter what to the very end of the age. And this is what Paul understood as he could be joyful in prison and within his present, present circumstances. And this is what we all need to understand about God is that the faithfulness of God is independent of your present circumstance. The faithfulness of who God is, is completely independent of your circumstances or whatever you're going through today. They're not the same. So if your life is good, if you're headed to Hawaii, God is faithful. He's good to you. But if your life is difficult and you're finding yourself in turmoil and you're not sure how you're going to get through your next day, things are not working out for you, God is faithful. He's the very same and he's with you to the very end. He never leaves. So when he's telling us to pray and he's saying, don't worry, don't be anxious about anything. You're thinking, but I want this to work out. I want to control my circumstances. Don't you know that the worry that you find within your life is typically because you have lost control of the way things are going to work out? You don't know physically how to make it work out. I can remember our oldest daughter finished grad school recently, and I can remember when she was finishing up her bachelor's degree and she was applying to grad school. Now, Callie was pretty much an amazing student. She had made straight A's within school. She, As a senior, she was chosen as one of the, the two students that got to be a senior clinician during her senior year, which meant she was already seeing patients. And so she had applied to grad school, and then she was not getting her letter about getting in and not getting her letter about getting in. And then she got the letter that said, I'm sorry, but you, you haven't gotten into grad school. And we were all just, we were stunned. And she was so worried. She thought, what, what am I going to do? This is, this is my plan. This is what I'm supposed to do. And now I, I haven't gotten in. And I remember she thought, I don't, I don't know what else I can do. There, and there was nothing that any of us could do to change the outcome. She had not gotten into grad school. She was just going to have to wait, reapply the next year. She had nothing else to do. She would just have to take a year off, reapply the next year, and try and get in then. And I remember telling her, Callie, what is in your control to do? Because here's the thing with our life and when we pray, we can pray and we can do whatever is in our control, but the outcome is always up to God. It's always up to God. And so she said, I, I don't, I, there's not really anything else I can do. But what she did decide to do was to go see her advisor and talk with them and find out like what went wrong and what could she do differently to reapply next year that might 
help it to look a little bit different from her. So she got denied. She wasn't going to get in. um, But what could she do differently next year when she went to apply? So she went, she made an appointment. It was really hard for her. I remember she was extremely sad and disappointed and worried and wasn't sure what she was going to do with her life. But she went and talked to the advisor and then she left and, and she called us and she said, yeah, I talked to them. And they said, you know, it could be, you need some more volunteer hours and some different things. I remember her thinking, you know, I work, I, I, I work all the time and I, you know, I'm trying to help pay for college and I don't know how I have more time to volunteer, but I'm gonna try and do it. And so she started looking at places that she could um, just begin to get some experience this next year before she could reapply to grad school. And then she called a few days later and I remember she was tearful on the phone. And that's like the panic that hits a mother when your child calls and they're crying on the other end and you're thinking, you're just like bracing yourself for the worst to just hit you in that moment. And she just said these words, I got in, I got in. And she's crying and, and she said that um, this year in grad school where she had applied in Stillwater, they typically accept 30 students, but this year they were doing some restructuring in the program and so they were only accepting 20. But then this advisor that she had met with to find out what she could do differently for next year evidently had met with a board and they called her and they said, you know, We were only accepting 20 students this year, but we met with the board and we've decided to take 21. And you are number 21. You see, when you want to be worried and anxious about how things are going to work out in your life, it's not going to do you any good. You can do what's in your control but leave the outcome up to God. You want to be number 21 and watch things work out? Then leave the outcomes up to God because he says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will wear. Paul is telling us Jesus is near to you. He is with you always. Your present circumstances are not conditional upon the faithfulness of God because he doesn't know how to be anything else to you but faithful to work out the things in your life. So we are to pray without worry. We're to rejoice and find our joy in the Lord, draw near to God because he's always near to us and trust and believe that the outcomes are certainly going to work in your favor every time. Amen. Amen. Verse number six says, do not be anxious about anything, but everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I think it's interesting that he says, do not be anxious. We can apply that to our life, but can you imagine the first century Christian? Can you imagine the the fear that they had, the anxiety that they had every day of their lives, going to bed, not knowing that you would be woken up in the middle of the night and and persecuted or go to jail or someone might see you the next day. They didn't know. They heard the stories. So he's giving them, and this is a serious issue for them, and he's saying, listen, if you're anxious, if you have anxious times in your life, let me give you the remedy for it. And he gives us three things. Number one, by prayer and petition with, he includes this in, he puts this in, with thanksgiving. In other words, don't just always be saying, oh God, oh God, oh God, help me, help me, help me. Help me with all these things that are going on in my life. Where are you, God? He understands that we are going to have petitions. We are going to have prayer. But in the midst of that, stop what you're doing and thank him for what he has already done in your life. Thank him if nothing else. You stop and thank him for the things. Find something. Find something that you could be thankful for. That's the remedy. If you're going through these types of things, if you're going through anxiety, you can't sleep at night, you always feel tense, you always feel anxious about stuff, dedicate to this prayer and petition and be thankful for everything that happens in your life. And the the scripture says, and if you do that, the God of peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He will guard you. He will keep you. He will protect you if you'll learn to do that. The second one here we're looking at, it goes down into verse number th- number eight, and it is right thinking. So first is right praying. The second one is right thinking. Look at verse number number eight. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, here's what he says. Think on these things. Think on these things. 
Let your mind focus on the things of God. If there's any good in your life, if there's any good in any situation that you see around you, I want you to stop and focus on the good that you have in your life. It's easy to focus on the bad things, isn't it? When we think back about our lives, it's easy to remember the, the, the valleys. It's easy to remember the times of destruction. It's easy to remember the times when I felt like everybody had left me, when I went through problems, when I cried all night. I remember those times in my life. Those are easy. Those stick with me in my mind. The ones that are hard to remember is when I was at the top of the world, when everything was going well, when I got the promotion, when she said she would marry me, when I found out we were having kids, when I found all those kind of great things in my life, it was exciting for me. Those things aren't so memorable. Why is that? It's because we always want to focus on the negative things in our life. But scripture says here, listen, if there are good things that are going on in your life, no matter what the turmoil is, stop and think about those good things. Because when I am being positive with my life, positive with my mind, not letting my mind go to the negative, I will begin to build up myself and build up the people around me as Christ begins to make himself known. And all of a sudden I realize, listen, it may be bad on the outside, but God's doing something good on the inside. It may look bad on the outside. No amens on that one. Thank you. But God is doing something good inside of me. He's blessed me. He's provided for me. We live in America. We're Sooner fans. We're cowboy fans, all right? I mean, we're hurricane fans. We have got, God is good. God has blessed us. He's provided for us. I've got a friend of mine whose mother was diagnosed as cancer, with cancer. They were a, a medical family, and, and um, as soon as they found out that the mother had been diagnosed with cancer, the family was in the room, and once the doctor left, um, the, the father, his, his name was Dr. Winslow, Actually, one of the, if you are OR, ORU folks, he's the, the one that actually started the City of Faith and administrated that. But Dr. Winslow was the, was the husband, and he got the kids in the room and the wife, and he said, from this point on, there's going to be no negative spoken in this room to anybody or for any reason. Anytime we talk about cancer, it's going to be positive. We're not going to listen to all the stories that everybody says, oh, well, my mother died. Oh, my grandmother, she went through this. We're not going to listen. We'll stop them. Only thing that's going to be coming out right now is only positive. From this point on, it's going to be positive. And that family focused on the positive stuff. Give me the positive news. If there's negative news, you can tell me that in private. But as far as it is in front of my wife and everybody, we're going to be talking about good things. If there's anything good, think on these things. If there's anything positive, think on these things. And God will reward us. He will help us with this process. Now you say, Pastor, then where does faith come in? Faith comes into this process the whole way. We have, there have been doctrines that have perpetuated, especially here in Tulsa, that we speak, as Christians, we speak things into existence. That he has given me the authority, we speak. I actually heard one pastor on the radio actually say that we live in a dispensation of limited sovereignty. That God chooses to not be sovereign and allows us to speak the things in existence that we want. God gives us that ability to do that. That's, that's just ridiculous, all right? I won't use stronger words than that. That's just ridiculous. God is sovereign. He doesn't need you to speak anything into existence. He didn't need someone to speak into existence when Saul was on the road to Damascus and he knocked him off of his horse and Jesus appeared to him. He didn't need anybody praying and interceding for him. God did that all on his own, all by himself. That's who God is. Here's what my positive speaking does. When I speak positively, it helps me increase my faith so that my faith can come up and well up inside of me and connect with God so that God can do the impossible in my life. My speaking doesn't change it. My speaking changes me. And now on the inside, I begin to do, develop the faith that I can have to believe in the impossible. So being positive in these situations is key for us when we're going through storms. Yeah, it's so true. You know, brain studies show that what we focus on in our life 
truly does expand. Whatever you focus on, it's gonna expand in your life. So if you're telling yourself, I'm always gonna be in debt, you're just always gonna see that big number that feels insurmountable. You can tell yourself, I'm always gonna be late. I'm always gonna be running late. And you're just showing up late everywhere you go. You can tell yourself, I'll never be a morning person. And you'll always be sleepy every time you wake up. The more you're telling yourself, I'm not a morning person. I'm not a morning person. Whatever you're telling yourself about yourself is going to expand in your life. It's why the Bible was so clear about the things we needed to focus on, the things that are true and right and lovely and pure because all of those things are things that are true of us. It's what he put down inside of us. You know, I have this saying in my kitchen and it says, you know, there's a a skinny girl who lives inside of me and she's trying to get out, but I can usually shut her up with cookies. And it's just, it's so, it it hangs over my pantry and it can be cookies, it can be um, M&Ms, or right now it's candy corn and peanuts. (laughs) And I'm just shutting that girl up. But here's the truth. It's like, there is this brave girl living down inside of me. She wants to get out, but I can usually just shut her up with fear. Make sure that she knows that she's, I'm just afraid. I'm too afraid to try that. I'm too uh, afraid. I've always been the type of person that is just afraid. It's like, there is this believer inside of me, this, this, this girl that she wants to believe for the impossible to happen in my life, the thing that doesn't look like it's going to work out, that girl, she's on the inside of me. She is trying to get out, but I can usually just keep her quiet with doubt. I just keep her quiet, keep her tucked in there with just lots of doubt because I can tell myself, you know, it's just, I haven't seen it work out yet. It's, it's probably not going to work out. It's probably not going to work out. I probably prayed the wrong way. As long as you're filling yourself with constant thoughts of fear and constant thoughts of doubt and constant reasons why you can't, then you can't because that's what's going to expand in your life. But God is saying, I've put this on the inside of you. I spoke these things. I put them right here for you to focus on. The things that are true about you, the the things that are inside of you, I put this vision and this purpose and this dream inside of you because if you will focus on what's right about me instead of what is wrong about you, Mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure that everything works out in your life. Mm -hmm. Stop focusing what's wrong about your life and what is right about God instead. You know what I have to tell myself now? I'm like, that girl inside of me, just let her out. Let her shout that God is good, that what is on the inside doesn't have to be stopped by fear or worry or anxiety or doubt or it's probably not going to happen or I haven't seen it happen yet. Today is a new day for God to do something in your life, but you have to to pay attention to what you're focusing on. Mm -hmm. You've got to focus on all that is good and right and true and lovely about this God that you serve so that he can bring all of those things from within you to the outside world. Mm -hmm. That's good. Amen. So so I'm okay to eat cookies? Is that, that's what I got out of that? Yeah, you're okay. Cookies are okay? Cookies are okay. She got these new cookies this past week. What were those Oreo, that had graham graham cracker Oreos. Okay, so we might be a little bit of a house divided, but we had three sets of different Oreos in our house this week. We had- We're united on Oreos, okay? That's the united. Mocha Oreos, which I ate the package. We had cookie cookie butter Oreos. Kelly ate the package, but Braxton didn't like them. We had peanut butter Oreos because Braxton liked those ones. I had some of those too. Yeah, the Oreos are- I love cookies. Probably gone. Number three, we, we, we go quickly on. Number three, look down here. The, the last one is, is right living. Look at verse number nine. Whatever you've learned and received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Listen to this last, last verse. And the God of peace will be with you. He's saying here, listen, the very last thing is whatever you've seen, whatever you've heard, whatever you've ex- experienced and witnessed from me, Put it into practice. In other words, I want you to do what I'm doing. 
Paul says here, and there's another scripture in 1 Corinthians 1.11. It says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In other words, he's saying, listen, follow me as I follow Christ. The last thing, when you go through tumultuous times, First thing I want you to do is begin to pray. The next thing I want you to do is begin to think the right things. Think on scripture. Think on positive things. And the last thing I want you to do is I want you to not only have role models in your life that you can look at and mimic your life after and practice after them, but here's the thing, fellas, especially dads, may we be the example in our kids' lives that when they are in hard times and they need someone to run to, that they can say, that's how I want to deal with hard times. They look at us. They look at us. And men, that's hard for us sometimes because we have all kinds of things we do. We explode or we shut down or we run away or we you know, seclude ourselves or we get negative or we have habits and crutches and things that we escape and medicate our bodies with to try to get out of the stuff that we have. And a lot of guys aren't very vocal. We don't like to talk about stuff. We don't like all that emotional stuff, you know? I mean, we watch Hallmark movies, you know, not, we don't watch them on our own. You know what I'm saying? We don't watch them. We don't sit there and watch them on our own. There's a method to our madness, all right? There's, (laughs) that's just the way it goes. Fellas understand what I'm talking about. So that's the way that goes. But there, I want to live my life in such a way that my kids and the people around me, when they go through tough times, they say, that's what I want to live like. I had a friend of mine, I didn't really know him in high school. I knew of him. He was a wrestler. Um, I played football and basketball. So, you know, wrestlers, they're just a different breed of cat. You know what I'm saying? They're just kind of, anyway. He was a wrestler. I didn't really know him, but A few years after I got out of high school, I was in a store walking around, probably three or four years after I got out of high school, and I saw this guy, and I kind of saw him, and I recognized him, but it wasn't like, you know, I went to Brooklyn Air High School, it was a big school, so I didn't just, you know, what's up? But he came up to me, and he said, I want to introduce myself, and and I said, I know who you are. He said, I I want to tell you a story. He said, when I went through high school, I knew who you were, but obviously we never hung out, we weren't really friends. But he says, once I got out of high school, I really kind of lost my way. And I got into some things that weren't right for me to get into. And I got into a bunch of trouble. And I finally kind of hit the bottom. And I had to make a decision what I was going to do. And he said, and I just stopped and thought. And he said, I thought, who do I know in my life that I would want to mimic their life and I would want my life to be like theirs? And he says, and I thought of you. And he says, and since that point, I've changed my life. Now this guy had gotten into full-time ministry. He was traveling with Toy, Toy Maker's Dream. If you guys remember the, the production that was here years ago, he was traveling with Toy Maker's Dream. It completely changed his life. And I got to be a part of that. I didn't know him. I didn't know that I was going to be a part of that. But I was going to be a part of that. And here's why. Here's why. Because the only example I knew of how to live my life through tumultuous times was my father. It's the only example I had. I never learned how to beat on my wife. I never learned how to turn to alcohol or addictions to try to cope with the situations of life. I never learned how to explode and lose my temper and and fight or try to hurt somebody. I never learned that. I didn't know that that existed because I grew up under a man who had such a godly heart and such a heart for people that he taught me how to love people, how to pray for people, how to endure hardships, how to be the husband that I needed to be, how to take care of my family, how to take care of my wife so that when tough times came in my life, I had the example of my dad. And I want to be that for my boys and my daughters. And I want to be that for my grandkids. And I want that legacy to continue. And I want it for you too, fellas especially. I want it for you. We can change the world. Do you understand that when a man comes to Christ, 93% of the time his family will follow him. If a man comes to Christ, 93% of the time his family will follow him. Listen to this. If a female, if a woman comes to Christ, if a mom, if a wife comes to Christ, 17% of the time the family will follow her. 
So men, we hold the destiny of our families in the choices that we make through tumultuous times. They need someone to stand up in the front of the ship and navigate them through it. They need someone to stand up in tumultuous times, not run to the woods or run to the garage or run to the man cave and shut the door or run to the bar or run to wherever. That's not what they need. They need a man to stand up and be the man that God has allowed you to be and take that leadership role, not to dominate the woman, but to live with her and work with her, but there needs to be someone who's going to be the strong one that forges the way. That's what God's asking for men to do. You know, it's, it can be easy sometimes to look at someone else and say, yeah, you can put all that into practice. You were that person that people looked up to. You were that one that had that father that poured all of that into you. And I didn't have that in my life. What, what if you come from that place and you're like, you have no idea what I have been through or where I have been. I can remember report card days in our house when my kids were younger and I never really worried too much about report cards, but I always wanted to see them. And I had um, three out of the four kids report cards and I didn't have Braxton's report card. And I'm like, Braxton, where's your report card? I haven't seen your report card. And he didn't, he never produced it for me. And I, I can remember being in the laundry room and opening up the dryer to get the jeans out and these, this paper, pieces of paper just like poured out of the dryer. And as I started collecting all these pieces of paper, it was like this ball of a torn up report card. It had been in his pocket and it was just like this ball of mess. And I remember thinking, what am I supposed to do with this ball of mess? I can't, I can't piece this back together to see how well he's done. And sometimes I feel like that's my life. I feel like I'm just like offering up to God just this ball of a mess and saying, can you do anything at all with this? Can you do anything at all with this? You see, everything in our past is preparation for our future. We've been talking about that even in our accountability circle. Everything that we've went, to, went through is prep for our future because God doesn't waste one thing about your life that you've been through. And you can, you know, they say the reason why people would get so discouraged all the time and so discouraged from putting these things into practice or, or believing for things is because you feel small. You just feel small. You feel insignificant. You feel like you just don't have very much to offer. And this is what I would say. The way to combat feeling that, feeling small, the way to enlarge your life is to be able to realize that your life is not just about you. Enlarge your life so that you can show up for other people and do something of significance. And something of significance isn't always, it's not big, it's not grand. Sometimes it's as simple as a phone call. I can remember a call that I got that completely changed my life. When I was in, um, it was my senior year of college and I had not graced the doorsteps of a church in a long time. You see, I can say with all certainty that the worst decisions I ever made in my life happened between the ages of 16 to the ages of 22. But I can remember it was a Sunday morning and it was early and my phone rang. And that is just an unusual time and it, for a college student for a, a phone to ring anyways. And my phone rang and I answered it. And it was a Sunday school teacher from the church that I had attended back when I was in high school. Someone I haven't heard from in years, not in years. And this person on the other line was just saying, this is, this is so-and-so. And I just want you to know that we have invited um, some people back to church, the, the people who used to be in my old Sunday school class, we've invited them back to church this morning and we would sure love it if you would come. And here's the thing, that Sunday morning, I was laying there in my bed before the phone rang on the heels of what would be some of the most tragic decisions I have ever made, feeling the very lowest that I can remember feeling in my life. And then my phone rings. And I get a call and invites me, someone invites me to church. 
and I pull myself out of bed and I go and I show up. That simple phone call from someone I hadn't seen in years who I wasn't even close to in my life by a simple phone call began a journey back for me to God. I can say I'm standing here today because somebody called me on the phone and said, hey, I would love if you would come to church. It's as simple as a phone call. So when you're saying, I feel small, I'm not sure what I can put into practice, I don't really have any gifts or talents or there's not much I can do or things aren't going right in my life, what if you begin to take that focus off of yourself and focus it on other people and just do something as simple as the phone call that God lays on your heart to give and you change the course of somebody's life? You change the course of somebody's family. Now our kids can say, I have a mom and a dad who've poured into me. They're, people look up to me because of what they did for us. You can totally rearrange the direction that your life is going because of God. But what you can't do is do that if you just sink into yourself and not put these things into practice in your life. But there is someone out there that needs you to show up for your portion of the world because you are going to be so significant for them. I mean, what if there is something for you to do, something that you haven't even done yet, and you were just put here in this world right now for that to happen, for you simply to make that phone call, for you to start that business, for you to change the course of somebody's life because you're providing them an amazing job. I don't know what it is, but it's time for us to put these things in practice in our life and begin to think, I'm here for a purpose. God wants to use me for a purpose. He doesn't want me worried, afraid, scared. He wants me to be anxious for nothing by all things praying with thanksgiving and putting these things that I've taught you into practice in your life. Amen. Amen. So let's start this morning. Let's start this morning. I don't know what God is speaking to you about this morning, but I know God's speaking to me that there are going to be storms that come through our life. And I have to make a decision. I have to prepare for those. Let's start this morning preparing for what's getting ready to happen, what's going to take place in the future. We start this morning through prayer through thinking right, and then through living right. From this point on, I'm going to change some of the things I do in my life. So